Father, we come before you this morning, Jesus, to ask you to be with us, Lord. Father, we thank you so much for the conference, Lord, what you're doing. Lord, the worship and the teaching of the word of God, Jesus. Lord, we pray that the Holy Spirit would be with each one, speaking, Lord God, leading, guiding us, Lord God, into all truth. And Lord, we do pray, Father, also for the fires down in Southern California, Lord God. We ask you, Lord, that you protect those homes that are in danger, Lord. And Father, that you just continue to speak to the church. Lord, we know the problem is not outside the church, it's in the church. And Lord, we need to just really face the facts, Lord, that we need more prayer, we need more teaching. Lord, we need more of you and less of us, Lord, constantly, Lord. So Lord, I thank you so much for this group of people, Lord God, that you brought here. And we want to thank you so much for the love and the grace and mercy you've given to us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Well. If you have your Bible, turn to the book of Job, chapter 1. If you were at the uh, last conference, I was teaching Job, chapter 1, and you know what happened to me, right? I had my seizure, and I had to be taken off the pulpit. I couldn't speak. And so I said, okay, Lord, I'm going to finish it. <laughs> I have to finish it. No, you know, Job has been a real, uh, how can I say, a real, not treat, but it really has spoken to me for the things that uh, I've been going through in my life. You know, like I said last night, it's embarrassing when you're teaching and then all of a sudden you feel this thing from your navel up to your brain and then you don't lose consciousness. I can't read and I can't speak, but I can. I know where I'm at. I know what's going on. But then if you talk to me, I'm like, way, I can hear you. You're way over there and you're right here. And um, I get this weird feeling from my brain so when I'm sitting down and I have the seizure, you know, it's like somebody else is talking to me and nobody's there, you know. And I told the doctor, I said, you know, what's going on with this here, you know. So they're going to be doing that uh, t in two weeks, the 24th. They're going to do a test. I have to check into UCLA and I'm going to be there for two to three days. They're trying to capture a seizure. So they can see what problem there is. It's a spot on my brain. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to ask them if I cannot take the medicine for two days. Because I'll know that I have a seizure when I'm in the hospital. You know, because I don't want to be there three days or four days, you know. Hearing people groaning and stuff, forget that stuff. <laughs> you know. But, but, you know, I've learned a lot through this. It's been 18 years. And uh, I've learned to be compassionate to people. I never was compassionate with sick people, never. When my wife got sick, no problem, you know, but people would come in to pray for their sickness. I go, oh, Dale, somebody else pray for them. I didn't have compassion at all until it happened to me. Then the Lord began to speak to me and say, you know what? How would it feel if nobody paid attention to you, especially me? I said, Lord, I already feel like that. You know, and so I, I went to the book of Job chapter 1, and I began to read, and the title of the message is, God can use you until he breaks you. Until he breaks you. I don't know if you've ever been broken, but when God breaks you, you know it's God. That he's the one speaking, he's the one doing the work in your life. And you either obey or you disobey. And then there are consequences. We have a will. So we have a will to make choices. So if I make a choice not to listen to the Lord and do what I want, I'm going to get myself in trouble. But if I submit myself to the Lord, then he can help me. Then he can be in my life and he can work in my life. And the worst times for me have been, I was in New Mexico teaching a men's fellowship and I had a seizure. And I've gone out so many times and had seizures where I couldn't finish my sermon. And at Calvary Chapel on Sunday mornings, I'm really doing really good. But on Wednesday nights in the last three months, it's like every other Wednesday I have a seizure. You know, and I can't really finish my study. I have to wait till the next week to finish my study. So I, I accept it. I accept it with all my heart because I know that God's in control of my life. And as I begin to read Job chapter 1, God spoke to me about Job. Job had everything in life. Everything in life. I've had everything in my life. Everything in my life. And uh, Job, you know, got to be tested. 
And when he got to be tested, he really had to be approved. And he was a real man of God. Now, one thing that we need in Calvary Chapel is young people. Young people, not old people. We're going to die. And I think it's important for me, for all of us here, to make sure you're open to the Holy Spirit. You're open to young people. For them to express themselves, like just like the last song, it's Calvary when they came. You know, they were nobodies. They came and Chuck saw the inspiration, Chuck saw the Holy Spirit. And what happened? God broke out. If we want a revival, we have to be revive ourselves first. That is important. And many times God, you know, in my life, God, the way he's revived my life has been through this illness. It's been incredible. I mean, just, you know, sitting there at night and all of a sudden I feel this feeling and, and the Lord says, hey, I'm with you. And then I begin to read chapter one. I go, Lord, I want to be like Job. I want to make sure that I stand in the trial that Satan will come against me. And I don't know if you have Satan come against you. Satan has come against me in so many ways, you know, in so many ways in my life that uh, he's trying to disqualify me from ministry. He's trying to get, divorce me from my wife. You know, all these things over the period of time, we've been married 56 years, this July. And we went through a lot of heavy things in our lives, a lot of heavy things in our lives because of me, not because of her. And uh, the Lord really just, you know, told me I'm going to teach you lessons. And I, I thought, Lord, what kind of lessons are you going to teach me, you know? Well, when I first got saved, he took all, everything that I owned, everything I owned, he took it from me. So I could trust my faith in the Lord. Imagine people bringing groceries to your doorstep when I've never had them in my life and not asking, but they're bringing it because we can't afford to buy groceries. Having everything in life. And then my wife getting sick. She, uh, she had something wrong. Well, she went to the doctor. They were doing a breast exam. And the guy came in and says, you know what? You have a little dot in your breast, but don't worry about it. It's going to be okay. You know, two years later, she has cancer. They remove her breast. And then all of a sudden, her liver now is in danger. Six tumors in her liver. I hate this. <clears throat> but I know that... Um, the days I spent with her at the hospital, you know, take my computer, do my sermons. She'd been there six hours, eight hours in the treatment, you know, and, and she was so strong, you know, and so uh, godly. And I said, Lord, what about me, Lord? You know, you know what? I, I want to take, you know, something in my life so that I can not only know you more deeply. I want to know you more deeply in my life. I don't ever want to deny you, Lord, ever in my life. As I began to read Job 1, the Lord really spoke to me about my own troubles. He reminded me that Satan has one third of an army that left, east, that left heaven with him. You know, and one third is a lot of, a lot of angels. Well, how many are in, in heaven? We don't know. Millions, billions of angels. And Satan is out to destroy each one of you and me. In the church in Calvary Chapel, in every way you can, he wants to destroy you. And I don't know what you're going through physically, which is bad, but what are you going through mentally in your life? I spent six months locked up in the hospital because I was insane. It was one of the hardest in my life. Hardest in my life. To be able to be locked up, you know, to sit there and they tell you you're crazy. They strap you up, they put you in. And I thought everything was over in my life. And then coming to Christ, all of a sudden I go, Lord, I'm, I'm healthy. I have all these things going on in my life. And now I have this thing that is embarrassing me. To be teaching, and all of a sudden it's like a little baby. <laughs> You know, and uh, I learned, my wife told me, don't, don't talk. She says, just go with your finger like this. I think just with your finger, 
go like this, and then people will get used to knowing that you're having a seizure. So at Calvary, where I pastor, they know that. And um, when that started happening to me, I can see the hurt, you know, and thank you for your prayers. Thank you. Um, but I could relate to Job. Job, I feel sorry for Job, you know, because of what he went through. He lost his whole family. And then he got sick. And his wife came along, you know the story. But as I was reading the story myself, I can remember that Job's life was incredible. He was blameless, integrity. He feared God. He stayed away from evil. Stayed away from evil. I think that's something that all of us can relate to. Stay away from evil. Because that's what the enemy wants you to do. To not only take evil upon yourself, but he wants evil to destroy you. To destroy you completely and fully. Imagine if you couldn't preach anymore in your community. Because you were disqualified. It not only hurts you and your family. It's like a domino effect all the way back down. And people don't think that. So what does God do? He uses things in our lives. He reminds us that he's in command. That he's in charge. Be you holy for I am holy. You know, and as I was reading his integrity and his fear for God, he stayed away from evil. He was renewed by, he was rewarded by God. Rewarded by God. He was loved by God. And he had faith in God. He had faith in God. I think that's something that all of us can relate to. We need faith in our lives. Uh, to be able to love our family. To be able to do what God called you to do. And to stand strong so other people can see your faith. You don't have to witness. I found my life, you don't have to witness. You know, we're supposed to be spiritual people. So we're supposed to see people that are sick. People that are hurting. That's why they come to church. I tell my, my staff, you know, we have a Bible school, which is school. But when people come, be simple with them. Be sensitive to the people's needs. I sit in the back, I have a screen, and I'm watching people in this congregation. I see some re re rejoicing, some weeping, crying, some, you know, just going through a lot of things in their life. And then the Lord spoke to my heart to start praying for them, to pray for you. Because I don't know what you're going through. But I know that uh, I've learned a lot of lessons in my life. A lot of hard lessons that I needed to learn in my life. I like what Billy Graham said. He said, Christians are called to suffer. God doesn't promise Christians an easy pathway to heaven. Nor does he promise flowery beds of ease. Think about that in your life. How easy do you have it in your life? How easy are you? I tell my staff, you know, people work for you a lot of times, you know, they don't see, they don't have to deal with the needs. You don't have to deal with all the situations, the problems. So, you know, they have a happy life. And I kind of remind them, you know, one day you might be a pastor. One day you might be, you know, if you're a single, a father and have children. And here we are today at this place, this beautiful place. What do you need in your life? What do you need in your life? Job was that person that not only was seeking and searching, but like James 1, 2 says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. And man, I'm an impatient person. And I have to learn how to be patient with a lot of things in my life and the life of my family. Trials either make you better or people bitter people. And how many people you know that have gotten sick and are bitter? Total bitter. You know, my mom was seen now. I had to take care of her. She'd come to church and I'd take her up at, after 12 o'clock noon. And, you know, after my service and I'd take her. She wanted to go to the Wiener Schnitzel all the time. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> when it's, so we, I take her, she go to the, she would eat her hot dogs and then she would eat ice cream, ice cream. And then I had to take her to that rest home, which just really, you know, really hurt me because, you know, she could only re recognize me. She didn't recognize anybody else. She's senile. And what she would do is she would hold my hand as tight as she could, you know. And um, it really meant it because I was a hard career. And she hold my hand and then it just melted. And then the Lord reminded me that what she had was not what I was going to have at that time. That you're going to have something even greater. And that's to stand in front of people in front of Jesus in a place where you're not acting stupid or you're thinking people are, are mocking you or laughing at you. And to continue the lesson, to finish it, that's my goal, to finish my lesson that God gave to me at the last conference. I couldn't do that. But I'm so glad that you guys were there and that the great speakers that were there to speak to kind of teach us the word of God as, as, as we see here, you know, seeking first the kingdom of God. But then Job in chapter 1, verse 1, he says, Therefore there was a man by the, in the land of us whose name was Job, and that man was blameless, upright, one who feared God, and who hated evil. And he had seven sons, three daughters, were born to him. So he had a huge family. And also his possessions were 7,000 sheep. 3,000 camels, 5,000, you know, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people in the East. Can you imagine that? The greatest, thinking nothing will ever happen to me. Nothing, because you're healthy. That's what I thought. You know, there's no problem, no problem with me. But then, in verse 4, and his son would go, to feast in their houses, each of his appointed day, and would sit and invite with three sisters and eat, then drink with them. And so it was when the days of feasting had run their course, that Job would sin and sanctify them, and he would rise up early in the morning to offer, to offer burnt offerings according to the number of them all. For Job said, it may be that my sons have sinned and cursed God in their hearts. Thus Job did regularly. Now how can a person like that get tried by the Lord? Think about it. He's doing everything he's supposed to do. We're doing everything we're supposed to do. How would you feel when God says, I'm going to try you? I'm going to try you to see your personality. I'm going to try to see what kind of a person you are so that I can I can use your life. If you're faithful in the little things, I'll make you greater in the bigger things. But you got to pass a test. you got to pass a test. And the test is not becoming great. That's not the test. The test is to become nothing, to become something for him. That is important in my life. And God has spoken to me in, in such a way in my own personal life when I spend time by myself that my wife filed me and the Lord has shaped me. And he wants to do the same in your life. That you would not leave this hill without being touched by the Lord. That God will touch you. And when he touches you, whatever you're going through, whatever you're facing through, if you're bitter, get out of that bitterness. Because Job here, when he's praying for his family, he doesn't know what's going to happen. He doesn't know that Satan is going to be given permission to take care of his family and then to take care of him. But what has God permitted Satan in your life, in my life? Let me think about it for a second. You can become bitter and say, well, you know, God doesn't really love me. He wants me out of the church. He wants my, He wants to break up my marriage, whatever it is. But God is always for us. If God is for us, who can be against us, right? Satan. Watch this. Again, he says in verse 5 or 6, he says, And now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. 
and Satan also was among them. So here is the Lord. Satan has to present himself. He has to give, you know, like, here I am, you know, what, what do you want to tell me? And so they come and the Lord's there and the angels show up. Satan show up. And the Lord says, where you been? He said, well, I've been going up and down the earth, you know, and also you've been up and down the earth. He said, have you ever considered my servant Job? Mm. Well, you know, you're always protecting him. You're always watching over him. And Satan wanted to hear because Satan was desperate not to get to Job. Desperate. Imagine how Job feels about you, about your life. That maybe God will give him permission to do something in your life that you might not like, that it's going to hurt. That it's going to hurt you. And uh, when my wife died, you know, I saw a lot of people die in Vietnam. I had to put a lot of people in each other. And when my wife died, it was different. Totally different. It was, I thought, I feel like Joe. Lord, why don't you take me? I'm the one that was sick too, Lord. And the Lord just really spoke to my heart. And he says, who gives life? Who takes life? So you do. Forgive me. And Satan, I know, is trying to destroy my life. But I want to finish well. You know, I don't have long, but I want to finish well. I want to be able to accomplish what God called me to do. I like it. When I got saved, it was the best thing that ever happened in my life to meet Don and all these guys, their wives. You know, to see that there are people that care for you. The people that pray for you. And uh, Sharon and I, we used to stay up at night and we used to pray and we used to weep, cry together. And uh, the Lord would come, you know, to her. And uh, she lay hands on me, I lay hands on her. And we could tell that our kids were hurt, real hurt. Right now, my son's a mess because of what's taking place. But then I thought about Job. Now, Job loses his daughters. He loses his son. He loses his income. He loses everything. I mean, what are you going to do? You know, you're going to damn God. Or are you going to submit to God? Say, Lord, here am I. Lord, do whatever. Whatever. I don't care. Whatever. And as I was reading uh, this chapter, when it comes to verse 6, and he says, And now there was a day when they prepared to present themselves. Verse 7. And God said to Satan, From where have you come? And so Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro through the earth, from walking up and down it. And the Lord said to Satan, have you ever considered my servant Job? There's no one like him on all the earth. Can you imagine that testimony? No one like him in all the earth. Blameless. Imagine that. Blameless. Upright men. One who fears God. And listen, hates evil. Hates evil. Saints always trying to hit us with evil. You know, because we were in the world, you know, we came out of the world. But at the same time, I see pastors, I see people that, you know, God has blessed them and it's still part of the world. When the world destroyed us, the world did us in completely and fully. And look what he's done today in your lives and what he's doing in your life before you leave here. Why? Because he loves you. And because he cares for you. He wants you to finish well. To finish well the course that God has given you to run. With your infirmities, with all your situations, your problems. You know, the Lord is, if God is for me, who can be against us, right? So he's with us. And God was with Job. And Job didn't know what was going on at that particular moment. Because now Satan's given permission to go deal with Job. He goes on, verse 9. 
He says, so Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job really fear God for nothing? Hey, let's see. Why does he worship you? Because you blessed him. You have a nice bank account. He has a nice home. He has all these beautiful children. Is that why? He goes on. Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands. His possessions have increased in the land. You don't think he should love you? Look what you give him. What has God given to you that he can't take away in an instant? In an instant. That I'm not angry with God in my life, in any way, in any person. I've learned to forgive people. And I look at what what God has done in each one of you. Look at you guys here. In the presence of the Lord and the great men of God teaching the word of God. And you guys, great men of God in your churches with your wives and your children in the beautiful congregation God gave to you. And when they see you standing in righteous, when they see you standing when you're weak, when you're sick, whatever it is, you know, you don't tell them I'm sick. You know what? They can see it. They pray for you. They pray for you. A lot of times people want to be informative, you know, and I, 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 I'm, I'm not like that. I, you know, I'm just going to shine it on or whatever the Lord has, has. But the Lord wants to do a work through Calvary Chapel. He does want to do it, but he wants to do it through our infirmities to see how strong you really are. Are you really praying? Are you really reading? Are you really taking time to be alone so that God can speak to you? And Joe's going to learn that in his life. Satan plans out the whole thing. But then, in verse 11, he says, But now stretch out your hand, touch all that he has, all. He will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power. Wow. Only do not lay a hand on his person. You know, that brought joy to my life. He can test me, he can tempt me, but he can't touch me. And he can't touch you. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And now there was a day when the sons, his sons and daughters were eating and drinking. And the oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing. The donkeys were feeding and biting them, he says, by them. And when the, when the Sabaeans raided them, they took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants at the edge of the sword, and alone I have escaped from you. What does he do? He starts taking his finances, taking it away. I don't know if you've ever been there. It's a scary thing, you know, but when you become a Christian, you have to ask the question, is this a test? Is God testing me to see what I'm going to do? He, verse 16. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. And one thing after another thing after another thing, I don't know if I could bear it. Can you imagine? One thing after another thing. And then what are you going to do? And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, the Chaldeans formed three bands. They raided the camels. They took them away. Yes, they killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. So all his finances are gone. He's bankrupt. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and daughters were eating and drinking in their oldest brother's house. Now he's getting to the family. To the family. Pastor Dale, we've known each other for 60 some years. His, his son was killed in an accident. He's a highway patrolman. 
it probably when I went to see him in the morning, it was probably one of the heaviest times that I've seen in my life, in his life, where he couldn't say one word. I, what could I say? So I just pray with him, you know. And um, he and his wife, you know, went through a lot, a lot. But then they all came to a place where he said, you know what? The Lord now is going to work in my life. And he has worked in his life and he wants to work in your life. Maybe your son, maybe your daughter, maybe nobody's really died in your family. You know, maybe you're still alive. But there are situations that are going to come into your life that God is going to allow Satan to put into your life, believe it or not, to see if you really believe in God, if you really trust him. As long as we have a check, as long as we have everything, no problem. You know? But when you have nothing and you had everything, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? I would do what Job did. But before that, he had to learn as he began to hear all the kind of things in his life. He goes on in verse 18 again. And while he was still speaking, another also came and said, your sons and daughters were eating, drinking in the oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness. It struck the four corners of the house and it felt it collapse on the young people. Notice, and they are dead and I alone have escaped to tell you. God, I hate you. That's a lot of people's attitude. But what would you do? What are you doing in your life? Whatever you're facing in your life today, whatever you're facing, maybe big, maybe little, we still face things in our lives. And Job stood back, as we see in a moment here. And Job not only was a man of God, but at the same time, look what he says in the next verse. And then Job got up, He tore his clothes, his robe, shaved his head. He fell to the ground. And what did he do? He worshiped. Wow. He worshiped. That's what we're supposed to be doing, worshiping the Lord. Whatever trial, whatever thing you're facing in your life, man, worship the Lord. Worship him with all your being. Lord, I'm going through this thing right now, Lord. But Lord, I worship you. I love you. I know you're going to take care of me as you have in the past. Lord, I give you all the glory and the honor. That's what I've learned in my life to do. Because you can become bitter with life. You can become, you can become bitter as a pastor. You know, people that do things that you really don't like what they do. Or friends that break up and they come against you. And then your family comes against you. It's sad. Sad brothers and sisters or grandkids, whatever it is. And then all of a sudden they come against you and they don't like you. They don't love you anymore. And yet all you've done is help them all their lives and now you're trash. Out. And that hurts. That hurts. But you know what? We leave it in the hands of the Lord. I got to continue in my life. And my life is in Christ. And I, my life will continue to be in Christ. And to the day I'm in the presence of the Lord. And I pray for you. That God will speak to you. And God will teach you before you leave here. In such a way that when you leave here, your confidence will be in Jesus Christ. Your Lord and your Savior. And the reason I say that, as he goes to verse 21. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, naked I shall return there. And the Lord gave, the Lord, you notice, and the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away, blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin, nor charge God with wrong. And remember chapter 2, what happens? The Lord comes now. And he says, have you ever considered my servant Job? Oh, you protect him all the time. I'll tell you what, you do whatever you want, except don't touch his life. Remember, don't touch his life. And what happened to Job? Job learned. Job learned to love God. Job was blessed afterwards. Why? Because he went through a deep valley. 
a deep valley. And I was in that deep valley a couple of weeks ago. Lord, I want to get out of this valley. Lord, help me, please. And you know what, Don and these guys are so gracious, so gracious. They really care about you. You know, it's it's amazing how, you know, they they just really love people. They love people. They love you. They care for you. As a board, we care for you. And we want to see the best in your lives, in your family's life. The vision and the passion can continue in our lives for the Lord. And most important, I would say to you that young people will come to the church and that we would see a revival with the young people. I love young people. And I think that as Job says in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. I want to do that. I don't ever want to charge God with wrong. I want to thank Him for saving me, for baptizing me, and for using my life. Father, I thank you so much for your love, for your grace, for your mercies, Lord. A.W. Tolstra said, It is doubtful whether God can bless a man greatly until he has hurt him deeply. Lord, thank you so much for your love, for your grace, for your mercies, Lord, for your chastening, Lord. Thank you so much. And Lord, I ask you that you continue to bless the conference. Bless his people, Lord. Lord, bless Don, his family, Lord. And Lord, we ask you that you continue to speak to Calvary Chapel, Lord. The next generation is to come, Lord. And Lord, that you provide your Holy Spirit upon us before we leave here, Lord. So that when we go down the hill, they can say that something's happened to us, Lord. And that's we got more of you, Lord. In Jesus' name I pray, God. And everyone said, Amen.